Welcome to today's episode of The Growth Zone. I am Christian Bartsch. What is the core benefit of listening to this show? Business leaders in corporate and privately held companies gain insights into trends and strategies that provide them with a competitive advantage in the marketplace. Each episode focuses on an area such as marketing, sales, innovation or funding that is absolutely critical to the growth of companies, whether they are startups or corporate global players, where management needs to juggle the challenges of market entry or knowing how to navigate the uncertainties of disruptive developments. Mind feeding is where clarity evolves and helps solving organizational challenges. For those who listen to the entire episode, I have a special surprise gift. I am working on some great guests that are industry leaders in management, innovation and marketing. Let's get started on today's episode. So today's topic is how do businesses build a solid brand development in a disrupted industry? And today I have with me Benjamin Shapiro, who is based in the San Francisco area. But before we go in deep into our topic, Benjamin, can you please tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am the host and producer of two uh, top 100 worldwide marketing podcasts, the MarTech podcast and the Voices of Search podcast which talk about how to use technology and marketing and talk about organic growth and search engine optimization. Um, prior to focusing on new media content production, I worked as an independent marketing consultant um, that uh, focused on early and growth stage businesses. Um, and then in you know a past life, I worked at eBay. I ran the marketing department at some early stage venture back startups in Silicon Valley. So kind of have a a broad experience in marketing that has turned into a career in content production uh, for the marketing space. Awesome. So um, when you think in today's days, we have so many industries, so many markets disrupted, whether people are moving on to buying stuff online or uh, changing their habits. For instance, people working from home and suddenly noticing that the urbanization is changing the way of consuming things, companies adapting to the way their employees are working and all these things. Um, of course, whether companies are in the early growth stage or their big family-run businesses, corporates, and so on, in some cases, they have to not only reinvent their products or their, product, their offerings, but as well the way maybe they communicate with the market and the audience. How do you see these things especially when we look at brand development and that. Yeah, you know, I think that there's a, a reshuffling of the deck that we uh, kind of expect to happen faster than it is. You know, we are in, uh, let's call it a similar to the industrial revolution, right? When there was the uh, invent and popularization of steel mills and of railroads that made transportation of products and services easier. Um, you know, that wasn't a revolution that happened in five or 10 years. It, it took tens, it took decades for it to fully mature and become the norm. And I think that we are still in the sort of nascent growth stages of the internet. You know, popularization of the internet happened within our lifetimes. I'm 40 years old now, grew up with a computer. The internet was something that happened when I was you know, 10 to 15 years old. So we're talking about a 20, 25 year long uh, cycle. And I think that we're still all adjusting in terms of not only our, you know, day to day lives and how we find source process information, but also how businesses are run and their ability to reach consumers. So, you know, when we talk about uh, building a brand, you know, there is a, a a different way and a process that is, you know, people have been building brands since companies were around. It's been uh, hundreds of years. 
Um, and, and, you know, brand means different things to different people. Um, but I think that now today, how people are thinking about brand is vastly different because of how you can reach consumers. It used to be that the problem was, I can't get in front of my consumer to get my message to them without having to pay a ton of money. And now I can get in front of consumers anytime, all the time that they're awake in front of a digital device, which is the vast majority of the time. I literally have one strapped to my wrist right now. Um, and so, you know, that process of not trying to figure out just how to get in front of your consumer and having one message to tell them, but how to constantly build a regular flow of communication that they feel they're getting value out of so they're not constantly being bombarded with advertisements becomes the challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's where then, of course, uh, creating proper content and, and it all f fitting into what is really relevant to the audience. And it's a big challenge, of course, because I think many people have as well keep adapting the way of consuming as well content online. Yeah, you know, the way that we consume media has changed drastically. Um, you used to get the morning paper. You'd sit down, you'd read the news and you'd see the ads for a half an hour. And then you'd go about your day and maybe you'd hear a radio ad when you were in the car or maybe you'd see a billboard or maybe you'd see a television ad when you were watching tv but there were infrequent ad delivery times and they were kind of like in bulk and now we're constantly scrolling we're constantly checking for, even when we're on you know sites for business we're still being bombarded with advertisements cross promotions our inbox right we're always getting inundated with attention requests for our attention and so there's been a desensitizing to advertising um, and to me you know when you're thinking about companies that build the best brands they have the ability to stay in front of their consumers um, but they're also doing it in a capacity that doesn't necessarily feel like it is advertising where, you know, maybe it's advertorial or maybe they're just delivering content. The consumers feel like they're getting value out of the relationship they have with that brand and they're delivering the right message at the right place to the right person at the right time. And that's really, you know, the, the successful brands and the ones that are disrupting larger industries have a good understanding of not only who their customers are, which is probably the biggest key to brand success, um, but also they have an understanding of when they want to consume media and what delivery method and channels they should be sending it through. Yeah, and then that, of course, means as well to understand uh, what's actually really relevant to the person, not as well particularly in, in the content that you put out. Uh, as well relevant to the to the context of the platform, like whether you do TikTok, it has to have a different kind of context than Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook and so on. You know, and it's it's content, it's social media. There's obviously mm -hmm. still ad placements, your performance marketing, out of home. Like there's a combination of different placements you can use. And I think that, you know, it all comes down when you're thinking about branding Uh, mostly in, in an industry that is ripe for disruption, um, you have to have an understand of who your customers are, what their needs are, what the pain points and their dissatisfaction with the current solution is, so you can talk to them in the language that they speak. One of the one of the biggest things that I've done, you know, mostly when I was working as a marketing consultant, whenever I'm in house or, or working on a new brand, trying to think about the foundation of their marketing efforts. I have this exercise where I will sit down with the people that work at the company um, and interview all the, the key stakeholders and talk to them about who they think they are. You know, what, how does the company describe itself? What are the products? Who are the customers? What's the purpose of the products? What's the pain points that they're solving? And then in parallel, I'm also interviewing the people that are their either existing customers or their prospects depending on how mature the business is. And the exercise is not just getting the inputs from how the company describes itself and then how the customers define their problems. It's the overlap between the two of those. And to me, that's really where the brand lives is, let's take a, a popular example, like Lyft and Uber, two, two contrasting brands that have disrupted a large industry. You know, they have different customer bases. Um, and they have different brand perceptions. The product is basically the same. 
Um, and you know, to me, the the takeaway from you know thinking about those two brands as contrast is one is centered more on urban city centers, and one is more national coverage. And so, one is meant to be ubiquitous. And one is meant to be sort of uh, specialized, Lyft being more urban, city center, modern, bright colors. And Uber is more, you know, the the black monotone color palette. And that comes from trying to think about who their customers are. It's, Uber started off a very sophisticated luxury product and worked its way down. And Lyft was meant to be fun and meant to be unique and and have more of a community sense. But by understanding their customers, they both found their paths for differentiation and they were both able to make successful businesses in an industry that was, you know, clearly had an incumbent dominant player in, you know, the the taxi industry. Yeah, and that's uh when you look at other industries, it's similar then, of course, when you look at uh, whether it's food like McDonald's, Burger King, Subway, and so on. They address as well different kind of people, different ages, different cultural things. And when you think of it, for instance, uh, products that companies, for instance, would buy, let's say elevators, you've got so many brands there uh, that, for instance, like Otis, who was one of the inventors of the of quite some safe features in elevators uh, around the world and then you have many other companies schindler and all around the world so you travel somewhere on holiday or you go in business somewhere whether it's a hotel or a house you'll always find different kind of products different kind of designs technology but at the end for us users it's an elevator but of course hmm, interesting then how then somebody decides uh, to buy a certain industrial product and yeah, it's of course as well some kind of branding uh, challenge as well because you have to yeah you know uh, branding is obviously critically important. I think that most people think of branding as your color palette, your logo, um, and I think of branding more as the foundation of marketing. You, you mentioned a, a very B two B industry. Um, you know, I, I know nothing about the elevator industry or who the major players are. So I don't know if I could specifically speak to that. But, you know, when I think of branding, it is, and this sounds a little wishy washy, but the mission, the story, your positioning, like branding is not just, well, what's our logo look like? Or, you know, uh, are we pink or black? Um, it is understanding the overlap between your customer needs and your company. And if you have a good understanding of, you know, what you're trying to, what problem you're trying to solve and who you're trying to solve it for and why you're doing it, um, you know, that, that narrative tends to win out. And so the companies that spend time in the beginning um, or, you know, they stop and they, they redefine their brand tend to be successful if they have a good understanding of why their business is operating. And so, you know, the elevator industry, you know, Otis might be marketing themselves as the, I, I know nothing about their brand or where they're positioned because I haven't really thought about the elevator industry very much, but they might be positioning themselves to be the most trustworthy brand because they've been building elevators for 500 years. Maybe 500 years is too long for elevators, but a long time as opposed to, you know, an incumbent might say, look, the elevator industry is ripe for disruption and we want um, a more modern experience. And so we're trying to, you know, improve on the industry standards because people need faster transportation to get up and down. Right. You're, you're coming up with two different brand perspectives, but those are based on uh, – understanding your customers, right? Maybe it's at high-end hotels, they want more efficient uh, transportation, or maybe they want a more luxurious uh, ride, something that feels a little bit bigger and safer with fancy buttons. Um, exactly. You know, it, it really depends on the understanding who your customers are and the problems that they're trying to solve. Yeah, and exactly. And there's so many different other business areas of B2B, for instance, where you have uh, totally different things. But in the end, it always comes back to customer journey, uh, customer story, uh, founder story, or the product company story, whatever, uh, which, of course, is interesting for the people. And you see it when you look at different companies that are very f not focused, like eBay and, and Uber and so on, at consumers, but are actually at the economic buyer in a uh, 
medium, large or corporate company, multinational company, they of course have as well some kind of story, whether you look at companies like Siemens or you look at uh, General Electric, Airbus, Boeing and so on. There's so much going on. Just even in the travel industry, when you look at uh, what all these brands are showing, they're show trying to show that they're innovative, they're testing new aircraft with hydrogen or electric, or they're investing in startups and so on, where they're showing, hey, we are innovative by our aircraft and so on, because, of course, they know in a few months or a few years, uh, different airlines will decide, hmm, we have to now maybe uh, buy new aircraft that are cheap, more efficient and so on, that we pay less tax on fuel and other kind of stuff, where they, of course, start thinking, where should we do? Or should we still go with Boeing or should we still go with Airbus Mix? or take an additional thing. And even electric things, that's the thing. I was just reading a, a report a few few weeks ago about um, small airlines that actually are the feeders towards the big airlines. For instance, from rural areas, they, they um, transport maybe 10, 20 people every two or three hours or so for maybe... 100 miles or a bit less and if they switch over to electric they can save a lot of money and if if a big airline buys such a small company they'll of course decide hmm we can't use a 737 on it we need to have something different but we can't adapt 100 percent our branding to that uh, of this company because maybe it's focused on business travelers it's a, maybe a business jet company so it's a different brand yeah, you know, it, it, branding can be very complex when you start working with, you know, large enterprises. And it was interesting when I worked at eBay a long time ago, um, they went through a, a huge acquisition phase, right? eBay was the internet darling, this startup that couldn't be stopped. This is before sort of the rise to prominence of Amazon. eBay was the first major e-commerce platform. Hmm. Um and people thought of it as you know places where you could buy used stuff, and eBay always sort of rallied against that as you could find anything on eBay new or used. But as part of that, they acquired PayPal, they acquired StubHub um, to get into the ticket marketplaces, they acquired uh, a host of classifieds brands, including part of Craigslist, and then they acquired Skype. And there was a big question in terms of branding of what was the purpose of the Skype acquisition. And I was sort of in the center of the product integration after the acquisition. And it was really kind of an interesting time where eBay bought this asset thinking that they were going to move from being an e-commerce provider to be e-commerce payments and communication. And all three of those things were pillars of the internet and they were just going to be this larger holding company. And it didn't work because it just didn't fit into not only the the mission of what the company thought it was itself, but consumers were confused. Why does eBay need to own, a, you know, an IP telephony solution? It wasn't going to help sell products, and people thought of e eBay as an e-commerce platform. And so, at the end, you know, the brand and the the distinction of what the purpose of the company was really stopped the acquisition from being successful. Now, there were some other things that happened in terms of, you know, what the relationship was between eBay and Skype, where there was this big earn out. So Skype was trying to focus on near term revenue as opposed to, uh, you know, focus on sort of the, the greater good of the eBay brand. But at the end of the day, the reason why the the relationship didn't work and eBay ended up selling off the the Skype product to a private equity company who then sold it to Microsoft was it just didn't feel like a fit in terms of the brand. It didn't fit in with the core mission of what the company was for, which was, you know, commerce classifieds made sense with eBay payments made sense with eBay. But when you get outside of that commerce bucket and understanding who you are and what your customers expect from you, then all of a sudden you run into problems. And I think the Skype eBay example is you know, a good one that highlights that. Exactly, because when you compare it with, for instance, with uh, the eBay PayPal, it made sense. You, you could accept, uh, people had already been accepting selling stuff using PayPal on the websites, and then combining, combining it with eBay was perfect, made sense. Uh, even today, 
uh, when eBay is already moving many sellers to have their own uh, to to use eBay's own payment system, you still can pay as a consumer or as a buyer you can still pay via PayPal or credit card or whatever kind of way. So it's, it still makes sense somehow. Yeah, uh, you know, and, and going back to the brand conversation, um, you have to have an overlap between wh- who your what your customers want and what they expect from you. And so, you know, the the way to build a successful brand, whether you're an early stage company, whether you're a growth stage company, or whether you're an enterprise like eBay, is to have your finger on the pulse of your relationship with your customers. You actually have to talk to the customers. And, and, you know, whether it's surveys, whether it's, you know, smaller companies just inter- actually interviewing the customers, sitting down and having coffee with them, but understand the pain points that they're, you know, they have, what their expectations are and how they think about your brand. And if you have, you know, an understanding of your customer's mindset and what they, you know, would expect from you, then you can you sort of work from that point. And obviously you could try to manipulate it and change your customer's perception of you, but you really have to understand your customer's needs, wants, desires, pain points, and how they view your company to evolve into a successful brand. Yeah. And then that uh, would enable you as well to monetize your customers because you've got the whole set fitting. They've got the branding fitting, you've got the offering fitting, the value proposition is there, everything matches and it's not a a mixed box of colored eggs where nobody wants to take something from it absolutely yeah so um it was great having you here on the show benjamin and if we people really want to get in contact with you and um, find out more how maybe you can do business with each other or exchange ideas and so on how can they get in contact with you yeah, you know, I think the first place that I would lead people to are the the podcasts. We produce two daily podcasts. Hmm. Uh, the Voices of Search podcast is about growth marketing, organic marketing, SEO. Um, you can go to voicesofsearch.com. Uh, the MarTech podcast, which is the, the more broad marketing show, technology-driven marketing, is martechpod.com. Um, if you're interested in contacting me, you can go to my consulting website, which is benjshap.com, B-E-N-J-S-H-A-P.com. And there's social handles for all of those. But if you're in the podcast app store, just search for MarTech. We should be the first listing or, or look for voices of search. Cool. Great. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Growth Zone with Christian Barge. Thank you for listening. Please leave a review or rating here on iTunes or on podchaser.com. If you found the content helpful, then share it on social media. I would like to invite you to follow our show so that you don't miss the upcoming interviews with leaders in the market. Simply visit the website follow.prmediareach.com. I will be adding the link also to the description of this episode so that you just need to click on that link. For those of you who are listening and signing up to follow the show, 
I have reserved a free copy of the ultimate guide on content marketing. This is the strategy that got me top corporate clients like McDonald's, Linde, Hewlett Packard, Deutsche Bank, Volvo and many others. That strategy has been working for over 10 years. It also got me contacts with police, transport authorities, military and several universities and even leading research institutes. For sure, it also worked wonders as it got me many small, medium-sized entrepreneurs and enterprises as clients. And that even included international clients from all around the world. The link to sign up for our free broadcasting service and the guide is follow.prmediareach.com That will give you access to the most recent version of my ultimate guide on content marketing. You can follow me as well on Twitter by using the Twitter handle CAP Barge. That's spelled Charlie Alpha Papa Bravo Alpha Romeo Tango Sierra Charlie Hotel. Yes, that is CAP Barge. Charlie Alpha Papa Bravo Alpha Romeo Tango Sierra Charlie Hotel. Thank you.